If you enjoy Jerusalem Unplugged, you may also like to listen to Stories from Palestine podcast. My name is Crystal. I am originally from the Netherlands. I am married to a Palestinian and I live in Beit Safafa between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. I studied history and tour guiding and I produce a weekly podcast called Stories from Palestine. You can find it on your favorite podcast player or go to the website storiesfrompalestine.info. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure that my guest is Dr. Adi Almusen. Adi is currently a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow and Visiting Assistant Professor at Grinnell College. And today with him, we're going to talk about uh, uh, his award-winning essay with a working title, The Print Culture and Literary Journalism of 1960 East Jerusalem. Adi has recently won the Dakak Award, which is awarded by the Jerusalem Quarterly. But that's not the end of it. In fact, I just want to also mention that Adi, in his dissertation on modernism edge and intellectual history of Palestinians after 1948, was awarded the best dissertation prize in arts and humanities by the University of Minnesota. So with all of these awards and good news, first of all, Adi, welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the, I guess, a uh, very kind introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it's a very well deserved introduction. And my first question is very much about yourself. So can you give us a sense of your background and your connection with Palestine and Jerusalem? I mean, I guess my background is, I guess, is a more simple immediate one. It's just the fact that I am uh, a Palestinian Jordanian myself. So um, although I, uh, Grew up and did much of my uh, most of my schooling in Jordan and and then some of it in Abu Dhabi. I did visit Jerusalem a couple times when I was really young, but I feel like I was too young to remember much of it at this point. So I guess the connection, I guess, is a personal personal one given my own background, and uh, yeah, and I, I guess I'm interested in ideas, and I I guess I, I found the how Palestinians were expressing themselves in the immediate aftermath of 1948 and the Nakba, I found that fascinating. So that's, I guess, my connection to it. And this goes right into my, my second question. You're interested in Palestinian intellectual history, particularly post-1948. Now, intellectual history is a, a rather you know, unusual field. There are plenty of works discussing uh, Palestinian intellectual history, but not as many as you know, works covering other regions. And so I was wondering, what did bring you to work on this particular topic? Well, I must say that, I guess, growing up reading, I, I, growing up, I enjoyed reading poetry. And for some reason, the poetry from that period, especially from figure, figures like uh, Rashid Hussein, Fadwa Tuqan, and Tawfiq Sayyid, really, uh, I don't know, was, I guess, the, some of the poetry I enjoyed the most reading personally. So I guess I had that poetic connection to that period somewhat. And then I, I kind of dug more deep into it as I did uh, my PhD. But to be honest, what really kind of made me move into this field of post-1948 history was kind of my frustration with, um, I guess, there is this trope of interpreting all Palestinian writing and all Palestinian thought under this trope of resistance, maqawama, or resilience, sumud. And I found, so I was interested in kind of, first of all, I, I was personally reading, I was tired of it. <laughs> and I just wanted to kind of unpack that. And I decided to kind of try to locate why, when, and how this trope kind of took place. And I was able to locate it somewhere in the late 60s. And and then 
And that's really, I guess, what made me kind of probe this intellectual history. And I want also what's fascinating for me about this period, 1948 to pretty much 1967, we're thinking of the period, I guess, before kind of the PLO dominates the Palestinian and in many ways the Arab cultural agenda uh, in the sixth, we're thinking of the late 60s and 70s, you know, the Palestinian revolution. I found this period to be, I guess, far more, I guess, what defined what is understood as Palestinian identity, what is understood as Palestinian thought, what is understood as Palestinian writing was, I guess, a little more malleable and in construction than, than it would become a little later on. So that's part of the reason I was fascinated in it. Plus, unfortunately, hasn't been historicized much. As you know, as a, I guess a fellow historian of uh, Palestinians in Palestine, you notice that the historiography is very, very rich before 1948. And then there's this gap somehow, 1948 to 1967, then there's all these studies on the PLO, which tend to be generally either political or focus on film of the PLO or so on and so forth. So there's this real gap, not just in intellectual history, but I feel in other aspects of Palestinian life. So, so there's that too as well. Indeed, as uh, we mentioned in a previous uh, episode of the podcast uh, with uh, Kimberly Katz, there's also a, a large gap in the understanding and knowledge of the history of Jerusalem and Palestine under Jordanian rules. We know a yeah. few things, obviously. We we were able, historians have been able to write a few narratives, but uh, comparatively very little compared, for instance, to the late Ottoman period, for which in the last uh, two decades or so, historians have been writing a lot more. But I want to move to your uh, award-winning article that you published with uh, uh, the Jerusalem Quarter. Actually, I must say that it will be published by the Jerusalem Quarterly. And as I said earlier, it's a working title, uh, Modernism in the Old City, the print culture of the old city in the 1960s. I found the idea of modernism in the old city quite an oxymoron, this idea of uh, something modern and the idea of the old city, which is often portrayed as something uh, unchangeable and very old, in fact, ancient, very interesting. But my question is, what is modernism in relation to Jerusalem and Palestine looking back at the 1960s? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I know uh, that, like you said, that title is in progress. I know folks in the, want me to change the title, but the idea was basically, I really wanted to play on that, I guess, oxymoron. I mean, I'm aware that the barriers of the old city are very different than the rest of, which is why I focus pretty much on East Jerusalem, not the old city, but I'm applying it, I guess, more universally. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating period because if, for example, I mean, if, if you think there's this study by Tom Simmerling, I think on postcards, from that period and he's looking at both Palestinian and Israeli postcards and there is this kind of focus and especially one the ones coming from the 50s and 60s there's I guess a continued focus on displaying this Jerusalem that is kind of amenable to the I guess occidental gaze of like an ancient city timeless so on and so forth and I guess you have a lot of that especially coming in postcards and pictures of that city so that's I guess I kind of wanted to disturb that. And I found looking at specifically, I guess I picked up at first this magazine, but I'm trying to go a magazine called the Ufuq al-Jadid, the New Horizon. And I just found uh, their conception of, first of all, uh, their operation in, Jer in Jordanian and Jerusalem in the midst, I guess you're looking at the period in the sixties, which was uh, at the height, I guess, of dictatorial phase of the Jordanian regime at that point. And they've managed to produce a very, I guess, interesting literary scene centered in Jerusalem. So that's one thing I was interested in. And then the other thing is related to Arab modernism, I guess the notion of al-Hadath al-Arabiya, which is the more kind of broader historical and thematic understanding of the period of the 50s and 60s of looking at all these modernist and modern innovations that were taking place in poetry and criticism and, and translation all across the Arab world, but they're often centered in Beirut or Cairo. So what's left out is basically cities like Jerusalem and other, I guess, other Arab cities are merely treated as basically kind of cultural vassals to what's going on in Beirut or, or, and Cairo, and that their intellectuals merely ape or keep up with trends emanating from either of these places. So I really wanted to disrupt that and First of all, kind of disrupt that 
image of Jerusalem, especially East Jerusalem, is that kind of ancient old city through a focus on its intellectual culture, but also kind of questioning how we understand Arab modernism as one that's primarily centered in Beirut and to a lesser extent, Baghdad and Cairo. So. The main focus of your work, in fact, the article is really based on uh, this magazine that you mentioned, Alufuq al-Jadid, was established by Amin Shunar, and we're going to talk about him later. But I was wondering why this particular magazine and how does this magazine help us to better understand Jerusalem, Palestine, and Palestinian history? So the magazine is honestly what attracted me into, like, I picked, I started, like I said, when I did my res, uh, I did my research in Jordan and Lebanon. And one thing I would do in my research along with, I guess, official sites like, like the AUB collection or the National Library in Jordan is I go through old bookstores and kind of dig up their, <coughs> I guess sometimes often they have those really they have those basements or back rooms that are completely, they haven't been touched for decades at point and the books are collecting dust over there. And I managed to find some issues of this magazine. And then I started reading it. And I was, first of all, I was fascinated that it was produced in Jerusalem in this exact period that I'm interested in. And I started reading its contents and I found it really refreshing. And, and that's, I guess I came, and that eventually attracted me into and that's really what got me into Jerusalem study. So I didn't start out being interested. I was actually more, I guess, along the lines of interest centering on Beirut. But eventually I found that this is actually far more interesting and far more fascinating. And slowly it kind of dragged me into this very good, <laughs> I guess, rabbit hole that I'm enjoying being in of Jerusalem studies. So, <laughs> and I, I'm happy that this magazine enabled me to do that. And yeah, why it's fascinating is, uh, I mean, like I said, it it is, although like what I try to show is how distinctive and I guess in some ways uh, uh, very specific to Jerusalem, the modernist experiment that this magazine embodied. But what's also fascinating is this distance that they had from Beirut and Cairo allowed this magazine and its contributors and its editor, Amin Shunar, to have very interesting perspectives on the main literary and intellectual battles that were unfolding mainly in Cairo and Beirut. So I don't know, I just found its perspective. And again, it's focus uh, on the Nakba very, because I mean, many of the magazines as contemporaries at that point, especially if they had a modernist agenda, they would come from this kind of global cosmopolitan kind of idea of modernity and letters and so on and so forth. And and the magazine did espouse that, but it espoused it from a very specific, specific, from the very specific perspective of the Nakba, that it took the Nakba as this force from which modernism and literary modernism is possible. And that's, to me, what was fascinating. I'm very curious about the magazine. I want to ask you a few more things, but I, I want to go back to the, uh, the founder of the magazine uh, and the, I guess the editor too, uh, Amin Shunar. Can you tell us a little bit more about him and what did he want to achieve with the magazine? What do you think was he trying to do publishing literature, engaging with the question of modernism and particularly focusing on the question of the Nakba? So Shinar, he is a fascinating person. He was born in 1933 in Albire, I guess outside of Ramallah. Uh, but he, uh, he finished high school in, uh, in Jerusalem and then taught Arabic there for some time at the Ibrahimiya College in Jerusalem. So, um, so he started as a poet, sending out poems uh, to different magazines in Jerusalem, but even in the other parts of the Arab world. And I guess eventually he was seen as a rising poet and he had decent intellectual connections in Jerusalem. Eventually he was entrusted by Kuzdar al-Manar, the, the house running al-Manar newspaper was interested. It, it already had like a cultural section in its uh, newspaper, but it decided, dedicate, it decided that it would want to dedicate a full-blown magazine for culture. And that's how eventually they agreed, picked up Shinar and agreed for him to um, edit the magazine, which he did 
for pretty much uh, its for its entire uh, life, which is, was five years from 1961 to 1966. But what's fascinating about Chinar is that he kept, he wrote poetry, published his novels, published one novel and uh, a couple poetry uh, volumes. But he he stopped at 1967. Like he stopped publishing. In a way, I feel like his modernist. As soon as he was exiled from Jerusalem after the occupation in 1967, he no longer, I feel, dabbled in this experiment, literary experimentation that we so fond of before then. And what basically he does, he lives in Amman for the rest of his life until 2005. And I guess to make ends meet, he does uh, work as a TV producer, as a, t as a, I'm not sure if it was a producer or a writer, but he wrote a, a bunch of TV programs for Jordanian TV. And he did have a, uh, a section where in the new uh, in the store newspaper um but however during his for the people who knew him at the time basically said that he lived an extremely i guess secluded life and he kept minimal social contact and even there's this book on sufism in jordan that is actually painted him as a kind of a as, as a sufi so um and he even asked he he very, was very much against there was several attempts to anthologize his works into compilations, and he was very much against that. And even when he died, he said he wanted to be buried right away with no ceremony whatsoever. So, see, so, so, yeah. I mean, he it's that's part of the reason why uh, I guess we don't know much of him. And even Mahmoud Darwish, I think, once wrote that he is uh, he was like a poetic talent that died too soon. So it is. Um, yeah, so it's, I feel from basically from my basic study, I feel like the experience of 1967 and his removal from Jerusalem was far too traumatic for him. That I feel he, maybe he lost faith in the pro project he originally started with the Wolf of Jadid. And this is, like I said, I need to, this is just a hypothesis that I need to work through. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case. I'm curious about the stories that were published by al al Jadid. And also, do you have a sense of the audience of a magazine? Do we have a, any sort of uh, records that point out also to a possible exchange of letters between readers and the editor? Um, yeah, there is. there was a small section. It wasn't regular or consistent. There was a section where they had letters to the editor. It wasn't, but I'm actually applying for funds to go... Uh, to Jerusalem. So I want to continue. So I guess, like I said, this Ufuk of Jadid kind of dragged me into this very nice field of Jerusalem studies. So I do want to finish that up. And I want to, I've already identified several magazines that I operated, I guess, around the same time, or I guess during the Jordanian period more broadly, kind of 1950 to 1967. So I do intend to, this was kind of me dipping my toes in the field of Jerusalem intellectual culture during the Jordanian period. Um, but in terms of audience, based on just reading the magazine and its content and its articles and the way things are written, and this is just based on me reading the magazine, I believe it's, it was uh, mostly and based on their distribution offices, because all these magazines would have ads of their distribution offices, like a distribution office in Amman, distribution office in Beirut, so on and so forth. Uh, it seemed to me that their main audience was basically, I guess, the educated Arab reader who's generally interested in culture and literature. And uh, their largest distribution based, and again, I'm basing this on their distribution centers or uh, distributors in different, where primarily Jordan, East and West, I guess, the West Bank and the East Bank. But they also had distributors in strongly in the Mushrik, but also in other parts of the Arab world. So. Uh, and they did manage to attract, I guess, and this is a testament to it being uh, a decent magazine. They did manage to attract uh, contributions from uh, some uh, some of the world, Arab world's major thinkers, including Lada Saman, and even like uh, and prominent Palestinian thinkers like Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, who was, I guess, pretty famous by then, and also uh, some Egyptian Abdul Abdul Qadir Al Qut, Egyptian. Uh, critic and professor of Arabic, among others. So so it was, I feel over time after the first year or two, they were able to, I guess, gather contributions that go beyond, I guess, east and west of the bank, Jordan River. 
I'm curious about the relationship between uh, the magazine uh, vis-a-vis Jordanian authorities, given the fact that Jordanian rule uh, took different shapes throughout the two decades that ruled uh, Jerusalem and the West Bank. And also, I'm curious a little bit about uh, the, the position, again, of, of the magazine vis-a-vis uh, Palestinians in general. Um, you know, how did Palestinians see these kind of publications, uh, you know, looking into modernism, and also how the editor and other people contributing um, to the magazine saw the rest of the uh, Palestinians? It, it, was there a sense of elitism, or was it like a regular form of engagement? Um, I mean, I'm sure, I guess, given the nature of the magazine, that it was, I guess, had, did have some highbrow. I mean, just to, because I, I forgot to mention that its contents of the magazine included, basically every issue included short stories, book reviews, critical essays, poems that are both metered and free, non-metered. So they're, and this is one thing that debate that happened and and I mean, Shinar said his only criterion is not whether a poem is metered or not, but rather if it's good or not. And then there was always had a, because this is, was in the midst of this free verse poetry debate in the Arab world. Um, and they always had, and what's, and this is just to go back to your question about it. Although they had all these relatively, I guess, highbrow sections, but they did have a section that is very fascinating. And none of the, uh, at least, not many of the other Arab magazines I studied elsewhere have, where they had a section for budding writers. And basically what would happen is a writer would send a poem that he or she wrote or like a short story and it would get published. And then there was critique, criticism of it by established critics of, of that and kind of tips of how to improve your poetry or how to improve your short story or narration and so on and so forth. So that was something that's unique. And in terms of its, uh, I guess, politics with the Jordanian regime, again, like you said, this was a very, I guess, uh, an area, a, a period of, uh, I guess, I, I, the high dictatorial period of Jordanian regime. Um, and I feel Alouf al Jadid took the strategy that was common to, I guess, other cultural magazines in the Arab world, which basically is to present itself as a venue not of politics, but rather of culture and literature, which is indeed in itself as a political position. But basically that seeming cultural focus meant that al al Jadid did not necessarily feature political co- commentary on contemporary events, but it also did not sanction the regime either by publishing like panegyrics or so on and so forth. So it, it was able to tell that, I guess, uh, let's say not interventionist line on the contemporary and I think any diligent reader of the magazine will eventually pick up through its different quotes, through its different selections, through what it translated, through what it published, its kind of democratic anti-authoritarian line. And it's, I guess, firm belief in the justice of the Palestinian cause and its critique of what they kept calling, you know, the Arab regime, Arab culture, not necessarily Jordan per se. So if that makes any sense, so. It does, and actually, it made me wonder about what happened to him in 1967. You mentioned that he left Jerusalem. Was he expelled? Uh, was he uh, pushed to leave? Uh, wh- why did he leave? I mean, given that many actually stayed behind. So was his a personal choice, or or, is it, or was he forced to move to Jordan? I I am still uh, like I said, I'm still I'm trying to be in contact with his descendants in Amman. And I do want to ask about that. I'm actually going to Amman after, right now. I'm Princeton University, but I, I plan to go on Amman and I will be meeting with his descendants and his family. So like I said, his life, unfortunately, he also purposefully made his own life be vague for historians. He kind of wanted that. So, um, and because uh, like I said, he didn't want anybody to compile his work. He meant he maintained so i believe i mean like i said i i, I don't this is again i just feel like he, he it might have been just too traumatic event the occupation of jerusalem seeing it switch hands and i guess he for him to make a living he had to make a living in amman which he then ended up working for the jordanian television so so yeah i, I don't 
I'm not sure if this is a good answer, but I will definitely be, I'm definitely trying to find out more about him and his life. Well, it is a great answer because it gives us, uh, you know, this expectation to read more about him in the future. I want so, to go no, back to the... Sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. I just want to say he is one of the more fascinating characters that I've encountered studying Palestinian intellectual history. Interesting. I just want to go back to the uh, question of the Nakba because um, reading your material, I realized that the Nakba was at the center of, of this publication. And I was wondering, you know, what exactly, you know, what, what are the main themes of the Nakba that were covered? And so what were the ways in which the Nakba was discussed was about the refugees, the war, the internal politics of the Palestinians, what were the topics that were essentially covered about 1948? Um, thanks for this question. Yeah, I mean, the Nakba, as I think I said in that article, was kind of the raison d'etre of that magazine, but it did it not so much, I guess, from, let's say, political or maybe like analyzing events like this and this happened, like the massacres or so on and so forth, but rather it's so the Nakba as, as this, you know, springboard for producing a literature, a poetry that is able to kind of communicate the Nakba as a, as a very tragic human experience to do so through literature and through poetry. So I guess the impulse was to make the Nakba an impetus for, I guess, writing, for composing poetry, for new thought and so on and so forth. So it's not so much about the details and the specificities of the, I guess, the Nakba in terms of what happened, flight, so on and so forth, but rather um, using the Nakba and be, using literature as a means to express the Nakba and to make it into, and that's what was one focus is to be able to make Nakba literature become a world literature that is, you know, um, that it, it is able to communicate to across different languages, the, 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 you know, the tragedy that befell Palestinians in 1948. So I guess that's the main way that, uh, uh, I mean, Shannar, through the magazine, and many of the authors and writers he attracted under that magazine kind of conceived of the Nakba. So it's not like something like Araf al Araf, for example, where it's like historicizing what happened to this village and that village or so on and so forth, but rather thinking of using the Nakba as an impetus for thought, for literature, for poetry, for creativity in general. I'm not sure if you would like me to share them that kind of highlight this. So I'll just allow me to quote from uh, Shinar's editorial in the very first issue of the magazine from late 1961, and I quote, exactly in this country where the horizon of the Nakba stretches before our eyes and where the nation of aggression stands in our face as a ringing reminder of our people's infirmity and fail failure, there is dire need for a literary renaissance that depicts the catastrophe's horrors and vividly per perpetuates its memory. So this, uh, end quote. So, I mean, in many ways that encapsulates in many ways how what, what the Nekba meant for Shinar and for the magazine. I hope that was clear. It was clear, and it's and it's very interesting. It made me think about uh, the purpose. Um, was he afraid that the Nakba would be forgotten or maybe remembered in a different way? I mean, that remind me, you know, those authors trying to take a snapshot of something and making sure that would somehow stay and remain for future generations. No, I agree with you totally. I mean. Um... He was, he had that here. I mean, in different articles and in different writings, he said he hopes that one day that humanity wouldn't record upon us something along these lines that we've experienced this tragedy and we haven't recorded it in a creative way uh, or recorded its events and wrote about it, in, I guess, creatively. And I guess this relates to uh, this notion, and I'm quoting an article by uh, Manar Mahul, who is a uh, literature uh, scholar in, uh, in a, uh, a Palestinian uh, literature scholar in Israel. He talks about this as agoraphobia, which is basically the fear of being forgotten 
And I feel that in some ways, Shinar and and uh, and I guess his crew at Al Ufuq Jadid had that fear of being kind of forgotten, and you know, and and that's why they thought that's the best way to kind of avoid that and to move beyond it is by trying to record the Nakba and literature and poetry and so on and so forth. I was wondering about the legacy of Al Ufuq Jadid. Sure. It's work, but perhaps also, you know, similar magazines, particularly the question of, you know, modernity. How did this magazine, and if any, left, you know, any legacy? Yeah. So the, the main legacy of this magazine is actually it has this generation of writers, of short story writers and novelists that actually have its name as their moniker. It's known as Jil of Al Jadid, the, the New Horizon generation. And it's it includes writers who are pretty famous nowadays, including Mahmoud Shukir, Yahya Ikhlof, uh, Rashad Abu Shawar. So many of those writers actually got their start in this magazine. And in many ways, I guess, under, because I mean, Shunar would publish their short stories and invite, I mean, he himself would sometimes critique them, but invite other authors to critique those short stories. So over time, the writing, I guess, uh, evolved and somehow even their treatment of the Nakba in some ways evolved. I mean, for, I mean, the, in general, at first their treatment of the Nakba was, I guess, continued on this trope of lost paradise and so on and so forth. But then over time, they were able to kind of dip, dig more deeply into the existentialist and I guess um, crisis aspects of existence under the Nakba or as a Palestinian during that time. And and in many ways, this magazine and Chinar and his work was able to generate this, uh, I guess, like I said, this generation of short story writers who have now, who are commonly known in the literature, like I said, Jil Ufuq al So uh, that's, I guess, one legacy of the magazine. It produced this very influential group of short story writers and novelists. But also uh, another interesting uh, legacy is, uh, I mean, I feel part of the reason that it is this magazine, I find it interesting. It's kind of also falls in this right after, just around the time it shut, shuts down and its operations end, I guess, first of all, late 1966, but then the occupation happens in 1967. An important thing happens in the, I guess, the field of Palestinian intellectual and literary history, which is the poetry of the occupied land. And we're thinking of the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish and poets from, I guess, the Jalili, the Jalil area in Israel. And basically this poetry of the occupied land, which becomes what kind of Fanny very aptly calls resistance literature, becomes kind of the dominant intellectual trend in Palestinian uh, literature, poetry, and writing. And that in many ways results in, in I guess, the experiment that was al al-Jadid, the experiment that was what was going on in Jerusalem, in the 60s to kind of, I guess it, it, whatever it produced ended up being overshadowed by this very, what becomes very popular. Because every Arab magazine, every, many Arab magazines ends up dedicating issues or um, are giving up much of their space for these, resist, for these resistance poets, i.e. Mahmoud Darwish and so on and so forth. So the experimentation that Shunar and Ofuq Jadid was leading kind of gets overshadowed by this very new, uh, I guess, an interesting and trend. Is that, so that's, I guess, part of the reason why, although it was important, it just kind of was felt in a weird time where it just, where this resistance literature was just like big thing that overshadowed it. I have one last question. Is there anything that I didn't ask about your work? That you want to discuss? Uh, is there? Uh, <laughs> I feel like we went through a lot, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, I mean, like I said, all I will say is for for listeners is is that I'm currently working on a book that attempts to write the intellectual history of Palestinians between. Um, between 1948 and 1967. Again, this period for me is significant, not simply because it was 
um, not well covered, I guess, in the historiography. But I found that in many ways, understanding this period because it was in the immediate aftermath of the Nakba enables us to understand many of the literary intellectual trends that are still with us today that kind of emerged after 1967 with the dominance of the PLO and the resistance literature and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is actually, just statistically speaking, um, actually the number of books translated per year from 1948 to 1967 by Palestinians is actually higher than that produced, translated by Palestinian in the period from 1967 to 1982 per year. So, and this is, on a background where Palestinians, especially in Lebanon at that period, had much more access to publishing houses and I guess much more, I guess, income through the PLO and so on and so forth and its affiliated houses and other independent Palestinian publishers. So it's just, so it's also, I guess, just statistically speaking, seemed to have been a very fertile period that deserves really looking at. So I'm trying to write a history of that period and it moves along different cities. Jerusalem is obviously an important node in that story. Partly, like I said, it got me through this, this magazine got me into Jerusalem. And I'm very happy that it led me in that way. But I'm also looking at Palestinians who were in Amman, Palestinians who were in Beirut, Palestinians who were in Baghdad, and even Palestinians who were in the United States and Princeton and Harvard. So, so that's kind of what I'm trying to write right. This was Adi Almusen. Adi is currently a postdoctoral fellow and visiting assistant professor at Grinnell College. And his, his essay, The Print Culture and Literary Journalism of 1960s is Jerusalem, has been the recipient of the Ibrahim Dakak Award for 2022, and will be published in the forthcoming issue of a Jerusalem Quarterly. Adi, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.